welcome back to Cinema Wellman. I am your host, David. And if you placed a bet and um, I, that the gambling episode was going to happen this week, then you are a winner. Uh, your funds should already be in your DraftKings account. Um, when mobile sports betting became legal in Massachusetts recently, uh, I had the idea to come up with an episode that dealt with gambling movies. Uh, I did not come up with the title, Bets Pictures, but I wish I did. Uh, stories, and therefore movies in general, are conflict-driven. Normal human behavior regularly creates conflict in many forms. When you involve our so-called vices, alcohol, sex, drugs, gambling, the conflicts multiply and multiply. Addiction is serious business, no matter what the focus of the addiction happens to be. So movies about addiction tend to stay away from comedy. Not too many addiction comedies out there. Not good ones, at least. They're there, but they're few and far between. What I've assembled for you today are 10 of my favorite movies about gambling. I'm not saying that the best movies about gambling, just 10 films that deal with the subject that I would highly recommend. Since this episode is about gambling, you can now place your bets. I am setting the over-under bets for you. There are two of them. If you're up on gambling terms, you know exactly what I'm talking about. If you don't know what an over-under bet is, uh, maybe you need to watch more gambling movies. Here are the choices for you. There are 10 movies on today's list. The over-under for Oscar nominations is 18. The over-under for Oscar wins is 10. So make those wagers, and on we go. So again, over-under Oscar nominations, if you think it's going to be more than 18, you take the over. If you think it's going to be less than 18, you take the under. That's as simple as over-under bets get. All right, here we go. Um, I decided not to include any of the Oceans movies because I consider them to be more casino heist movies than gambling movies. Certainly gambling is involved, but I didn't include them. Our guys really aren't doing much gambling at all. Robbing, yes. Gambling, no. I also didn't include 21, which is a decent gambling movie, but it Carries the Kevin Spacey stink, so I will skip it. Maverick is also a decent gambling Western, but Mel Gibson, so... Well, you know, while I'm at it, let's talk about some other ones. Rain Man is an excellent film. Tom Cruise's best performance ever, in my opinion. Hands down, I think. Um, I think of a lot of things when I think of Rain Man, but gambling isn't one of them for some reason, so it's not on this list. Um, I absolutely hated The Color of Money, one of the worst Oscar makeup calls in history, and not even half as good as the 1961 film that introduced us to Fast Eddie Felsen. That 1961 film is on today's list. Two for the Money is a laughably bad drama about sports gambling starring scenery eaters Al Pacino and Matthew McConaughey. Skip that one if you ever get the chance. Also skip Vegas Vacation. Remember when I mentioned that there really aren't any really good gambling comedies? Vegas Vacation exists, and that statement is still true. I was never a fan of Casino. I know that they're not the same type of movie, but my Scorsese, De Niro, Pesci choice will always be Goodfellas. Other decent films that were considered for this list included 1974's The Gambler, starring the late James Kahn as a gambling addicted literature professor who loses it all. Another good bet, you see what I did there, is Paul Thomas Anderson's Hard Eight from 1996, starring the late great Philip Baker Hall, Mr. Bookman from Seinfeld, as a professional gambler teaching the trade to protege John C. Riley. This one is pretty down, that's for sure. A gambling comedy that almost works and is definitely worth a laugh or two is The House from 2017 starring Amy Poehler and Will Ferrell as parents who open an illegal casino in their friend's house when their daughter's college scholarship is taken away. That happens all the time, doesn't it? I mean, that's a, that's a common thing that happens. Uh, a key word here is it's oh, it almost works. I'll set the over-under for you at three and a half laughs. Paul Blart Mall Cop did not get those odds. Guy Ritchie's 1998 Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels was the odd movie out when I put this list of 10 together. I love it, and I do consider it a gambling movie, but the gambling isn't the center of the film, so it was the last film to be eliminated from contention. 
So here are the 10 that did make the cut. Will your favorite gambling movie be here? You may be able to find that on FanDuel. Everything is on FanDuel. Well, place your bets and let's get started. First off from 1998 is Rounders. In this poker drama, Matt Damon plays reformed gambler Mike, who needs to get back into the game when his low-life friend Worm, played by Edward Norton, gets into trouble. John Malkovich eats Oreos and the scenery in equal amounts as Teddy KGB. There's really nobody to root for here as everyone involved is either an addict or an enabler. When Mike and Worm get beat up, you can't help but think that they deserve it. This has an overall sleaze to it that that actually adds to its appeal. The card playing is informative since Damon narrates a bunch of it. This is dreary, and the addiction part of the movie is realistic. Malkovich's accent is anything but realistic. Give the man his mammy. It's, that wasn't that far off. That's how bad it is. Uh, check out a clip on YouTube if you don't believe me. It's comical. Give the man his mammy while he's eating an Oreo. Next, from 1974, California Split. I hadn't seen this in a long time, so I wanted to give it another spin on the old roulette wheel. California Split stars George Siegel and Elliot Gould, one a casual gambler, the other a pro. When they become friends, both of their lives take a downward turn. This drama features casino games and horse racing, and the pair do their share of both winning and losing, but it's mostly losing, and they also get beat up. When gambling is involved, a lot of people get beat up, or worse. Siegel and Gould are rather likable until the losses start piling up. Uh, In these films, characters are always in super desperation mode, and they constantly make bad decisions. We can see it, plain as day. They can't, very much like addiction. Next, from 1999, is Croupier. When walking into a casino at the start of the film, the title character, Jack, played by Clive Owen, says to himself, Welcome back, Jack, to the house of addiction. Jack is more than familiar with this particular house, and now he's back as a croupier. Jack is an aspiring writer and thinks that the life of a croupier would make for an interesting novel. Based on the events of this film, the life of a croupier would make a hell of a novel. When Jack begins dating a customer at the casino, which is a serious violation of casino rules, or so I'm told, things start getting complicated. He's then recruited to be the inside man for a casino heist, and I'm not sure that's going to turn out well. Even though there's a heist involved, the fact that Jack is a writer studying the casino and its patrons, the film is focused on just that. We are privy to all of Jack's thoughts about gamblers and gambling. This is well done all the way around. I was surprised it didn't receive any Oscar nominations, but then I read uh, that it was ineligible because it was shown on Dutch TV. Those meddling Dutch. The tagline for Croupier is, Life's a gamble. Indeed. Next from 2017, Molly's Game. This film starring Jessica Chastain has one of the best beginnings, it's actually a cold open, in recent memory. Molly's Game tells the amazing true story of Molly Bloom, an Olympic-class skier who ended up running the world's most exclusive high-stakes poker game and was later targeted by the FBI. So there's a lot to unpack there. I usually loathe Aaron Sorkin, but he wrote the screenplay for this and it was nominated for an Oscar, and I like this movie, so score one for Sorkin here. Uh, Molly is extremely strong and strikes an intimidating pose at times as the game runner, but she also has a vulnerable side to her that's just as interesting. She's caring and compassionate towards her players and looks out for their best interests. She tries to tell a player when she thinks that they have had enough, but, you know, addiction. The desperation is once again in full bloom as gamblers play for hundreds of thousands of dollars in her games. Character actor Bill Camp is tremendous as an out-of-control gambler who is on a terrible losing streak. Seeing him come up to Molly and asking for another $100,000 over and over is like watching a car wreck in slow motion. You know he has no way of repaying this money. And bad things happen to people who don't pay their gambling debts. Molly's life begins to unravel when she starts abusing drugs. 
her addiction in her world of addiction eventually brings her down. You see it coming from a mile away, but Molly can't because addiction. An odd resolution of this, in my opinion, but you can't change much of a true story. Unless, of course, you're Quentin Tarantino. Stop that, by the way. Next, from 1940, is Bob Le Flambeur. I was born with the ace of diamonds in my hand, so says aging gambler Bob Montang in this French thriller from the great director Jean-Pierre Melville. Bob is our title character, which translates to Bob the High Roller. Flambeur? High Roller. This High Roller has hit rock bottom after a big loss, though, and he decides to assemble a team to rob a casino. Seems like everyone wants to rob a casino. Bob Le Flambeur is, um, is the favorite film of director Jim Jarmusch and director Paul Thomas Anderson. And speaking of Tarantino, it's his favorite gangster film. Um, it's considered the precursor to the French New Wave in cinema that happened in the late 1950s. It also directly inspired the Transporter film series with its portrayal of a close relationship between a criminal and a police officer. There's a lot to love here, especially if you enjoy French cinema. I won't spoil the end, but these things rarely end well for those involved. And I'll leave it at that. You should see this for yourself. I will bet you love it. Lady Luck, his mistress, made him forget why he came. Next from 2003 is The Cooler. After rewatching all of these films and others that didn't make the cut, filled with all of these streaks, good and bad, and runs of luck, good and bad, I started wondering if luck is the root of a majority of this entire enterprise. Yes, you can know the games inside and out, and yes, you can have years and years of experience, but the cards are still the cards, and that little roulette ball ends up in the spot it's destined to land in whether you like it or not. The cooler is all about luck and streaks, but in a kind of a reverse way. The always reliable William H. Macy plays Bernie Lutz. Bernie is a loser at gambling and quite possibly at life. He has such bad luck that he's hired by casino boss Shelley Kaplow, Oscar-nominated Alec Baldwin, as a cooler. A cooler is someone whose luck is so abysmal that it rubs off on others. Anytime there's someone winning big in the casino, Shelley sends in Bernie. All he needs to do is hang around the winner, and abracadabra, they suddenly start losing. Problem solved. I really don't know much about gambling and casinos. Is this a real thing? Do casinos hire coolers? It all seems pretty superstitious and silly, uh, but this movie is extremely compelling nonetheless. Macy is, of course, a sympathetic character. You're rooting for him from the start. And when he starts dating a cocktail waitress played by Maria Bello, you assume his luck is changing. Bernie also thinks his luck is changing and wants to quit his job and move on to a better life. This does not set will well with Shelley at all. There's also some nasty business with Bernie's estranged son showing up. You smell a scam on that kid from the start. Baldwin, at times terrifying as the casino boss, even when he's not hitting people with lead pipes. Next, from 1961, is The Hustler. I mentioned The Color of Money earlier and how much I disliked it. I often despise blatant Oscar makeup awards. You see me, The Departed. Actually, no real surprise here, since The Color of Money is a sequel of sorts to this film that I happen to love. Pool is the name of the game here, and Paul Newman's fast Eddie Felsen is out to prove he's the best of the best. When you're trying to prove yourself in such a fashion, you go after the biggest fish in the pool hall. And in this pool hall, that fish is Minnesota Fats, played by Jackie Gleason. The Hustler earned nine Oscar nominations, add that to your total, including four actor nominations, acting nominations, Newman, Gleason, Piper Laurie, and George C. Scott. A Best Picture nomination and one for director Robert Rawson. George C. Scott refused to even be nominated, but that's another story for another day. The film won two Academy Awards, one for cinematography, black and white, and one for art direction, set decoration, black and white. I always thought it was interesting that they had, to sep they had separate awards for black and white and color films for several years. Not sure why they felt the need to do that. Silent films went up against talkies back in the day and competed in the same categories. I, I may have to look into that. 
All of these nominations were well-deserved, and I'm surprised it didn't win more than two. This film is a great character study of both Felsen and, to a lesser extent, Fats. Gleason's riveting appearances bookend the film with epic pool matches. 99% of the shots were taken by Newman and Gleason themselves, featuring excellent pacing and cinematography. The Hustler was shot mostly on location in New York City, giving everything a gritty authenticity that enhances all of the performances. The first of the two contests between the two sees Eddie up $18,000 before losing it all. Eddie then hits the inevitable downward spiral that includes a mobster breaking his thumbs. After recovering, he takes his last $3,000 back to the pool hall looking for Fats. One game for all the money, hoping that Fats can finish him off quickly and put him out of his misery. This is pretty bleak stuff here. Come for the two pool matches, stay for all the incredible performance th performances throughout. Next, we have The Cincinnati Kid from 1965. Steve McQueen takes Anne Margaret to a cockfight in this movie. I don't think I need to say anything else, <laughs> but I'll add that this is an excellent film and another great character study. Steve McQueen is the Cincinnati Kid, an up-and-coming poker player who tries to prove himself in a high-stakes poker match against a longtime master of the game. That's from IMDb. That master of the game is played by old friend of cinema wellman Edward G. Robinson, an all-time favorite around here. The supporting cast, Rip Torn, Tuesday Weld, Joan Blondell, Carl Malden, is also phenomenal in a movie that features plenty of intense poker-playing suspense and drama. This is hard to watch at times, as is the next movie on our list. As always, I won't spoil anything. I'll save that for our new series, Spoiler Alert. And now that I'm thinking of that, that will be next week's episode. I will ruin all of these movies by spilling all of those beans and letting all of those cats out of all of those bags. Skip that one if you want to see any of these first. Two to go. Next is Uncut Gems from 2020. I want to be upfront about something before I start this one. I have never been a fan of Adam Sandler. Nothing against him personally, of course. I heard he's a great guy who's very generous. I just never liked any of his characters on SNL and never thought he was really funny. I was intrigued when I saw Uncut Gems advertised. Once again, I'll go to IMDb for an assist. With his debts mounting and angry collectors closing in, a fast-talking New York City jeweler risks everything in hope of staying afloat and alive. Does that sound like Adam Sandler to you? Opera man? Cajun man, canteen boy. Um, I was pleasantly surprised by this movie and by his performance. It's a tad long at two hours and 15 minutes, but I believe it's because the filmmakers wanted to prolong our look into the chaotic madness that is the life of Howard Ratner. To say there's a lot going on in this movie is an understatement. I understand the complaints that the dialogue is all over the place and sometimes the yelling is distracting, but... I think it's a realistic look into the life of a degenerate gambler who's willing to risk anything and everything in search of that big win. This is sometimes very hard to watch, but it's compelling filmmaking with a realistic look at addiction and what it can do to a person. When a million dollar basketball parlay bet begins with who wins the opening tip off, you know things are going to get ugly. I look forward to spoiling this next week. And now the final film on today's list by leaps and bounds the lightest movie in the bunch. There are actually several parts of it that are quite funny. So I think it's a perfect place to finish. And that is from 1973. And it is really one of my favorite films. And it is The Sting. This film has an amazing Oscar-winning percentage. It was nominated for 10 Oscars and won seven. There aren't many movies out there that can beat those totals. I do realize that this Best Picture winner is more of a gambling adjacent movie as opposed to a full-on gambling movie but i didn't want this entire list to be such a downer and when i researched gambling movies on the interwebs this thing was on just about every list so it counts paul newman once again this time with his old pal robert redford in a depression era story that single-handedly resurrected ragtime music when it was released in 1973. newman is henry gondorf and redford is johnny hooker the pair of grifters team up to pull off the ultimate con and take the money of big-time gambler Doyle Lonigan, played by Captain Quint himself, Robert Shaw. Harold Gould, Ray Walston, Charles Durning, 
Uh, and Eileen Brennan co-star in this delightful con game of a movie that will keep you guessing like a good murder mystery. I love this movie and watch it regularly. It's such a fun time. So, well, how'd you do with your wagers? The over-under total was set for Oscar nominations. It was set at 18, and for Oscar wins, it was set at 10. Do you remember what your choices were? So here were the actual numbers. 21 nominations and 9 wins. How did you do? Were you a Bernie or were you a Henry? Just go to FanDuel and check that out. Well, that's it for this week. We hope you return next week for a spoiler alert episode that will ruin today's movies. No spoilers this week, all of them next week. If you don't want things spoiled, skip next week. I totally understand. But please return the following week for the best and worst of April's screenings. Until then, take care.